Welcome, everyone. This week, we're focusing on Inner and East Asia. We'll be talking quite a bit about three of the major dynasties in China, the Sui, the Tang, and the Song. But then we'll move on and we'll talk about Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. So our key concepts, focusing on the rise of empires, new crops, especially what China is making. Um, just a quick review, reasons for the fall of the Han. Um, you might want to take a minute and pause this just to, you know, kind of review. I know it's been quite a while since we've talked about China. So pause, and when you're ready, we'll move on. Hopefully now you've unpaused. So another review, map of the Han Dynasty. The sway will be considerably smaller, and there'll also be quite a gap in between the Han and the Sui. So really, we're, we're going to go for quite a while without any unified China because the Han dynasty falls in 220 and the Sui don't rise up until 589. So first, we're going to talk about the three kingdoms. Buddhism was introduced to China during the Han dynasty before 100 CE. The exact date is unknown. And as I've said, the Han Dynasty collapsed in 220 CE. And at first, the Chinese converted to Buddhism because they believed that the Buddha performed miracles. But there's a major obstacle in the spread of Buddhism, and that's its insistence on celibacy for the monks and the nuns. Chinese scholars insisted that Buddhist texts needed to be translated. And obviously... When you have monks and nuns who are celibate, the Confucian ideal of ancestor veneration cannot be done. Buddhism was also very popular in China because it directly addressed the afterlife and offered hope. Buddhists taught a doctrine of no self, that there was no such thing as a fixed self to be reborn. And by 600, there were three different types of Buddhist monasteries in China. And also during this time period, tea was discovered in the South, porcelain was developed. These are two things that China will become very, very well known for. And the three kingdoms develop the Wu, the Shu, and the Wei kingdoms. China will be reunified. Here are our three major kingdoms. But the Sui dynasty very short-lived, and we'll talk about why, manages to unify these kingdoms. But as you can see, it is considerably smaller than the Han was, and then compared to modern-day China, it's, well, tiny, to be blunt. Uh, China was reunified under the Sui in 589, and they established a government that was based on Confucianism, but it was heavily influenced by Buddhism. They also restored the Chinese imperial structure. So they, they brought back the Confucian rituals. Um, they were able to defeat both internal and external enemies. And the Sui were a patron of the arts. In 604, the Sui founder died and his son failed in a campaign on Korea. So these are two things right off the bat. The first leader dies um, within 14 or uh, 24 years of becoming emperor so he's he set a sort of a strong path to follow and his immediate successor fails on a campaign for expansion so that's problem one problem two is the grand canal the grand canal was very expensive now here's the thing it was very very useful because it connects northern and southern china uh we're talking about shipping goods especially foodstuffs but it was expensive. And the Sui, already weakened by this loss on a campaign to Korea with all the military spending and fighting back against external invasions, now you've got money being spent on this grand public works project. By the way, guys, this is still in use today, just so you know. Uh, all of these things combined meant that the Sui were going to be a rather short lived dynasty. Some of the leaders, however, did quite a bit. So Wen Di united North, South, and West China by the end of 580. So he is the founder of the Sui. And his accomplishments were numerous. A couple of different things he does. He has uniform institutions of government throughout the country. He raised a group of skilled administrators. He reestablished Confucian rituals 
that were last used by the Han, so he saves the Confucian ideals while simultaneously fostering Buddhism. He's a very tolerant man, and for that we thank him. He also sponsored codes and administrative laws. He simplified the tax code. Every 10 years, a careful census, which had not been done in quite a while. Again, you've got no unified central government. That's an issue when trying to keep track of the people. You have an army that is broken up into a system where when there is no war, they're self-supporting. These are people who have day jobs. When you're not at war, you go back to your job. When you are at war, we'll pay you a little extra for that. He also improved upon the Great Wall. A lot of repairs needed to be made. And obviously, of course, the Grand Canal. Um, the relations with the Sui and the Turks in the West deteriorated. And when the wars in Korea failed, the whole point was, oh, look, a, pl a place close by. Tribute, taxes, gifts. Well, that kind of kind of backfired. Uh, the second emperor, Yang Di, completed the integration of southern China into the empire, emphasized the Confucian classics for the examination system for public employment. So now you have promotions based on merit. It's not just the sons of imperial scholars, but we'll talk more about that when we get to the Tang. Um, also worked on the vast canal and built a second capital at Laoyang. So we've got two capitals now. Um, you've probably heard them before because they were the same capitals as the Han. And the relations, like I said before, with the Turks collapse. And as a result of, of that, uh, Yangdi is murdered. You know, you can't win them all. Um, he's murdered by a member of his entourage in 618. His successor was Gongdi. He ruled less than a year. And by that point, as you know, it went downhill. But on a bright side, that leads us to the Tang Dynasty, also called the Golden Age of China, focusing on the years 618 to 907. So the Tang are descended from Turkic elites. And as you can see, the territory is considerably larger than the Sui. Kaotsu was the first emperor, and he granted equal amounts of land to each adult male in return for taxes, and he also continued the trend of local government rule. He created a monetary system of copper coins and silk ribbons. This is kind of a big deal, guys. And he wrote a set of laws that were revised every two decades. That's pretty progressive. He's keeping up with the times. And these laws actually lasted into the Ming Dynasty, into the 14th century or, or the 1300s. And that's just what he did as emperor. In addition, expanding to expand that Confucian administrative system and reforming the exam system, he's a pretty liberal guy towards all religions. Obviously, the Confucian system works well. Um, and it's not just Katsu, that is. It's the Tang Dynasty in general, except for one emperor that I'll get to in a, in a little bit. We'll talk more about him, though. By 645, the next emperor, Taizong, had extended Tang borders into Central Asia. And he also supported Buddhist monasteries. He wrote a comprehensive law code called the Tang Code. And this is not the same thing as the laws that were revived every two decades. This is different. The Tang also introduced the equal field system as a new tax system. And education was also reformed. You've got the Confucian imperial exams. All promotions are based on merit, which leads to very wise court officials. Empress Wu is next. She is the only female empress in Chinese history. And how she became empress is she removed the rightful heir to the throne in 690 CE, and she recruited outstanding individuals to serve in her court. Buddhism was the favored state religion under her as well, like it will be under most Tang, because they use Buddhism to sort of legitimize their rule. And they attempted to make it a state religion as well. She financed the building of many Buddhist temples, but in her mid-80s, unfortunately, she was forced to abdicate. Uh, this would be in about the year 705 due to old age. And I want you guys to keep this in mind. 
She removes the rightful heir in 690, has to step down in 705 because she's in her mid 80s. So she would have been in her late 60s, maybe 70, when she actually overthrew an emperor. So let's give it up for Empress Wu, shall we? Let's talk about Buddhism a little more. So a couple of things you should know is the Tang emperors legitimized their rule and their control by using the Buddhist idea that kings were spiritual agents. And they used Buddhism to bring their subjects into a better place. The monasteries were important allies in the early Tang emperors because in return for their assistance in supporting the king and discussing how Buddhism can work to support the people, they're tax exempt. And they also received land from the king and gifts. Mahayana Buddhism was the most important school of Buddhism in Central Asia and East Asia. The Mahayana beliefs were incredibly flexible, which allowed people throughout China to adopt it. And it allowed them to sort of incorporate any local deities. It also encourages the translation of Buddhist texts into local languages. Now, there, um, with um, the Chinese language, you have Cantonese and Mandarin, but you also have countless local dialects. And encouraging this translation of Buddhist text really allows Buddhism to spread quickly. And the expansion westward of the Tang Empire, um, as well as its commercial and intellectual reach and success, not only brought Buddhism further into Asia, but really makes the Tang a truly cosmopolitan area. And this is why the Tang are considered to be the golden age of China is because of how liberal most of the emperors are towards religion. But like I said, not all. 843 to 846, you have the Edict on Buddhism. And I'm going to talk more about this in a couple of slides. But while we're discussing Buddhism, we really should bring it up. This is the great anti-Buddhist persecution led by Emperor Wuzong. And the whole point was to get rid of these monasteries to collect that tax money to sort of balance out the treasury after a long and, well, let's be honest here, expensive war. And it was also to cleanse China of foreign influences. In the first DBQ that we do, you are actually going to read the Edict on Buddhism. And Buddhism is discussed as this foreign barbarian therefore because if it's not if it's foreign it's it's got to be barbarian religion that has no business being in china but like i said give me a couple of slides we will get there the golden age guys here's why um the only major military pressure came from the turkish frontier but the turks are defeated which allowed for 150 years of tank control over that region and as a result of this impressive campaign and the victories, the common people were quite successful and content. And this is the era that you have woodblock printing and gunpowder invented. And the woodblock printing was carving characters into wood and then making copies of it. So this is the first time that you're going to be able to have copies made that are not done by hand. Now, unfortunately, the woodblock printing only a few copies can be made before it has to be thrown out, before that ink is absorbed by the wood. Under the Tang as well, you have rice farming, champa rice from Vietnam, which allows the population to double, and power moves from north to south. The Silk Road was also revived, and the Tang are contemporaries of the Umayyad and the Abbasids, which kind of makes sense because the Abbasids were also referred to as the Golden Age. Chang'an, you've heard that before. It was at one point the capital of the Han, was considered a metropolis at the center of East Asia. And it was the destination of ambassadors from other states who were sent to China under the tributary system. The capital cities become melting pots to many cultures and a large number of beliefs, especially Zoroastrianism and Islam. And the Buddhist missionaries had begun a very difficult journey from northern India to China 
But it really wasn't until the Tang Dynasty that Buddhism reaches its height of popularity in China. Because by the mid-7th century, new Buddhist schools of thought had developed a distinctly Chinese style, including a school at Chang'an, which later evolves into what will be called Zen Buddhism, which is very popular in Japan. The Tang Dynasty was a period of expansion, especially when it came to trading with foreign lands. You had caravan routes traveling as far as Syria for items that ranged from glassware and tapestries to jasmine and other exotic herbs, hence why this is called the Golden Age. Unfortunately, all good things do come to an end. Let's talk about upheavals and repression. During the late Tang period, the economy was suffering. Um, the emperor was a devout Taoist, and he attempted to eliminate Buddhism from 843 until his death in 846. Uh, his death is kind of controversial because he drank elixirs to help him maintain his, his power, his health. And there is a theory that he was actually poisoned while drinking these elixirs, either as an accident or somebody actually poisoned him. The world will never know. But anyway, the emperor began doing this by closing thousands of temples to take the wealth. And the attempt to destroy Buddhism lasted a very short time, but the religion never recovered from this and actually began what would become a steady decline in China. And the decline of Buddhism and conflicts between the Chinese and foreign traders marked the beginning of a change in Chinese attitudes. After hundreds of years of cultural exchange, the Tang is the place to be. Chang'an is referred to as, you know, we, we've talked about all roads lead to Rome. All roads lead to Baghdad. All roads lead to Chang'an. Well, this is the end of that. Hundreds of years of cultural exchange destroyed by this one act, the Edict on Buddhism, the elimination of non-Chinese values and thoughts and schools. Because by 836, foreigners would um, were no longer welcome in China. The first half of the Tang was successful. The second half declines all right that's a little depressing in 907 the last tang emperor was disposed of and the dynasty ended unfortunately when the tang state ended regional military governors from all that territory the tang had gotten were not able to maintain control and buddhism is gone Learning is gone about, about other cultures, and that is the end of the Golden Age. But our next podcast focuses on the song, and they had so many accomplishments, it will take me at least 10 minutes to get through it. So thank you all for listening, and have a great night, guys. Cheers. <laughs>